Hey everyone, I hope you're doing well today. My name is Brent Colby. I'm really excited to be with you. And as you can see, it has been snowing. And uh, man, it's been a ton of fun for us and the kids. Hope you're enjoying yourself wherever you're at today. And while we wish we could be with you in person, we're glad that we can be with you here, at least online. And we do look forward someday to connecting with you face to face as soon as possible. So thanks for joining us today. And today we're excited to share some really fun things that have been going on in my life. So uh, my wife's name is Bria. We've been married for about 15 years. And in fact, we have known Chris and April for our entire marriage and even before we were married. We go way back with them and we're really glad to be their friends. We have four little kids. Adelaide is 10. Oliver is 8. Owen is 6. And then Madeline, our youngest, is 3. And as we've been preparing to go into missions full time, she has... Uh, uh, always excited for us to arrive at a new place, a new church to share about our ministry and what's been going on. In fact, whenever we get somewhere, she, sh she throws her arms up in the air and says, we're in Belgium, which is not quite accurate, but she is very excited to, uh, to explore and to connect with you and all of our other friends across the Northwest here. We are going to Brussels, Belgium. In fact, uh, some of you may not be super familiar with the country of uh, Belgium. It is just north of France in Western Europe, and it has about 11 million people living in this country. And this is not a large place. It's actually smaller than our own peninsula here in Washington state. And among those 11 million people, just over 1% of them actually have a personal relationship with Jesus. This may strike you as odd. When you think of Western Europe, you think of all these beautiful churches and cathedrals on every street corner, and Belgium is no exception. However, for a number of reasons, the people there just are not connected to Jesus. We really need to see an explosion in ministry leadership and in church planting to be able to reach the people out there. And that is what God has called us to do. My wife and I will be serving at Continental Theological Seminary, which is in Brussels, Belgium. We're going to be going there with our entire family. I'll be serving as a professor of ministry. My wife, Bria, will be the campus nurse and engaging the community there as well, along with some other medical ministries based out of Brussels. And we couldn't be more excited to go. We responded to this call uh, late 2020 and have been raising funds for a few weeks and connecting with local churches. And it's just a joy for us to be with you guys today. And we're excited to tell you more about it. If you want to stay in touch with us and what's going on and know how to pray with us, you can always go to our website. That's at colbycommission.org. And there you can find out more details about what's going on. But for right now, we'd love for you to grab your Bible and open it up to Matthew chapter 9. We're going to start together in verse 35. But Matthew chapter 9 um, expresses this big idea that we're going to explore a little bit today. And that's this, that Jesus's followers send Jesus's message. Jesus's followers send Jesus's message. So if you have your Bible, let's just jump into the text. Matthew chapter nine, verse 35 says this, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. A few things that pop out to us that we should notice. And the first is this. Jesus was announcing the kingdom of God. This was a, a notion, an idea that the people of Israel had been waiting for literally for generations. If you're familiar with the Old Testament, you recognize that it kind of ends on a cliffhanger with prophet after prophet after prophet describing and foretelling that the kingdom of God was near and that Israel just had to wait and that a Messiah, a king, a deliverer was on his way and then nothing. There was hundreds of years of silence and Israel suffered in all sorts of incredible ways without that Messiah coming. And when Jesus came, he was telling everyone that I, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, I am here and with me comes God's kingdom. Now, this was confusing to so many people because the kingdom that they were looking for had castles and thrones and kings and chariots. And yet the kingdom that Jesus brought to us was so much greater than that. 
It was a spiritual kingdom, and it was made available to all people, not just the people of Israel. It was an incredible moment. So that's the first thing Jesus does. He announces the kingdom of God, and this announcement is ushered in with all sorts of signs and wonders, really validating that Jesus is exactly who he said he was. And the miracles of Jesus didn't just end with the ministry of Jesus on earth. They continued after he left through the power of the Holy Spirit. The apostles and the disciples and all sorts of men and women were just empowered to go witness and to tell people about Jesus. And they too performed miracles, validating the very message that Jesus had come to share. Second, we see this. Jesus has compassion on the lost. When he saw them, The text tells us that he had compassion on them because they were harassed and because they were helpless. Jesus cared deeply for these people. And third, we end with this great commission, this this great uh, uh, command, and that's this, that we are to ask for more workers to be sent to reach the lost. What's Jesus say? The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest then to send more workers. And this is true for our world today. People are lost and we need to go send out workers to go find them. And so here's a question. Here's a moment for you to reflect on personally, wherever you're at today. Do you see the lost people of our world today? Do you see them? Often the people who need Jesus the most are the ones who get along with Jesus followers the least. Okay, people often will share completely different values or or live completely different lifestyles or just be the type of people that that we would normally not want to associate with. And yet those are the people that need us the most. Those are the people that God has called us to engage with more than any other group of people. The people who are lost need the ones to find them. The harvest is plentiful, Jesus said, but the workers are few. Consider this. Check this picture out. Half of the world's population lives inside this bubble. Get that. Half of the world's entire population lives inside this bubble. Note that it is not very big, nor is it anywhere near us today. Let's go back to Belgium, a place that we're becoming more familiar with as we prepare to go into ministry there. Belgium has over 420,000 Moroccans that are living unreached which is to say that if they woke up today and wanted to go to church, there would be no place for them to go. There's no viable self-sustaining church planting ministry happening amidst those 420,000 people just in Belgium. Remember, this place is smaller than our own peninsula here in Washington state. In Belgium, this country, this little country, there are more than 26 unreached people groups. Again, those are people who, if they woke up today, they wouldn't have any place to go to church, even if they wanted to. The global need for outreach is great. Just take a look at this. I just grabbed three quick examples. We have 446,000 Tuareg in Mali, over 1 million Mandigo in Gambia, and 135 million Sheikh in Bangladesh. These are people who many of us have no knowledge of. We've never even heard of them before. And yet there are hundreds of thousands, and in some cases over hundreds of millions of people dying without ever hearing the name of Jesus Christ. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. As we began to prepare for our ministry in Belgium, we heard a number of different stories that were really compelling and exciting to us. And one of them that really caught my attention took place back in World War I. You see, there was a big offensive during World War I. It was known as the Ardennes Offensive. And some of you history geeks may have heard about this before. It's one of the largest offensives in history of all time. Over a million people were involved in this great assault. And a group of American soldiers were part of the assault in the Ardennes Forest. And at the coordinated time, they attacked and they broke through their lines and they made great advances. But unbeknownst to them, to their right and to their left, their compatriots did not have the same success. The Germans in defense, realizing this quickly, surrounded that division and totally captured about 550 men. And when I say captured, I mean that they had surrounded them and they had been fighting them. And the men were putting up an incredible defense. The only water they had to drink was from a small stream that happened to flow through their defenses. The only food that they had to eat was on their back. And over night, they were fighting just to survive. 
the division leader sent a runner to break through the German lines to return to the Allies and to tell them where they were. But more than one of these messengers were either captured or killed in an effort to send the message that would save the lives of all of the men. Eventually, as a last resort, the commander grabbed a dove, a pigeon really, a messenger pigeon, and strapped a message to its foot. Now this was not a completely uncommon way to deliver information, but this was a last resort for these people. They put the message on a small capsule on the foot of the bird and they set it to flight and the bird was immediately shot down. It hit the ground, shattering the hopes of all the surviving men. But miraculously, that bird got up and then quickly flew miles and miles and miles back to the Allied lines to deliver a message of hope that saved the lives of every single one of those men in that division. It not only told them to uh, stop the bombing of the German lines that had begun to fall on the Allied troops, but it also told them exactly where to go to rescue the men. And the Allies did just that. The bird was celebrated as a hero. It was flown back to the United States. It was awarded medals, all sorts of crazy things. It was a remarkable story and a remarkable picture of how powerful the delivery of a single message can be. You see, we too feel called to send this message to the people that need to hear it the most. And just like the soldiers, they feel surrounded, they feel defeated, they feel hopeless and helpless. And all they need is a message of hope that can be delivered to set them free. My question for you today is this, will you help send the message? Will you see and recognize the needs of millions of people who are dying without the hope of Jesus? And will you partner with us as we go overseas to make sure that this message is heard loudly and clearly all across Western Europe? Thank you so much for encouraging us and supporting us and being a part of our team. We look forward to the day where we can see you face to face. We thank you again.